All right, normally at this hour we are studying the book of Hebrews. Currently we're in the book of Hebrews chapter 10. But today, since this is the Sunday before so-called Easter Sunday, I figured we would switch gears so we can get this up on our church website and on our YouTube site by this evening and maybe this coming week people can learn a thing or two before next Sunday rolls around. And so I'm going to call this Bible lesson today, Hunting for Easter Eggs. Hunting for Easter Eggs. Egg. Now, I, I use that term on purpose because right now the term Easter Egg is used, uh, let's, for example, if a movie comes out, and people are watching the movie, and they're reviewing it, and then people are paying close attention to everything in the scene, and every bit of dialogue in the script. They find something they think is, a, they call an Easter egg, and that is a, some verbiage in the dialogue, or some object in the scenery, in the background, that offers a clue as to what might be contained in the sequel, the next movie. Or it offers more detail to the, the larger story, if you've got this ongoing series like Star Wars or the, you know, uh, the uh, Avengers and the Marvel comic movies and all those kinds of things. So they call them Easter eggs and people go through with nothing better to do with their lives than to search movies and look at scenery trying to find some thing that will give them a hint as to how the story is going to unfold in the, in the uh, next movie, the next installment. So uh, with that new definition in mind, we're going to hunt for Easter eggs and uh, deal with the subject of Easter. Good. So, um, Pastor Gene ha uses the, a whiteboard to draw timelines for just about everything, but we don't even have uh, an extra one large enough, and I don't really need to. But if you can imagine a, a timeline, and along that line we're going to put the pertinent scriptures that deal with this entire subject. Uh, let me run through a list of scripture verses. If you have a blank piece of paper, you're taking notes, or if you're watching online, and uh, don't just sit there in your pajamas and getting another sandwich from the refrigerator. Uh, get a piece of paper and a pen, and write these scriptures down in the order I give them to you. And then we're going to go back and review each one point by point. And I'll try to give them to you in the most logical sequence that I can to explain the timeline and the events of Christ's final week before Calvary and before the resurrection. So if you want to write this list of scriptures down as I give them to you, let's go. First of all, John 2, verses 18 to 21. John 2, verses 18 to 21. Then write John 11, verse 9. After that, write Matthew 12, verses 38 through 40. And then fourthly, write John 19, verses 30 and 31. And after that, write Leviticus 23, verses 5 to eight. And number six, write John 20 and verse one. Seventh, write Luke 23, verses 44 to 46. And I think that's sufficient to get started. So let's begin, we're gonna just Take these in order. Go first of all to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Lord Jesus said, Beware when all men speak well of thee. He said, For so did their fathers to the false prophets. So you have to take what someone says with a grain of salt, especially if they're giving you compliments. You don't want to get a big head and be uh, conceited. But if someone says something is so from the scriptures, 
you want to go to your Bible and double check and see if it's so. See if what they claim is actually borne out on the pages of the Bible. Like I said in our church hour, there is no verse anywhere that says Christ entered Jerusalem on the first day of the week, that so-called Palm Sunday. Not a single verse. It's just conjecture. It's just mythology. All right. Let's get started. John chapter 2, verses 18 to 21. They answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building. Wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Christ makes a general statement that if he dies or if he's put to death, he would or could raise himself back up in three days. Now run forward to John chapter 11. John 11. And one verse here, John 11, verse 9. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. Here he makes another general statement, and he asks a rhetorical question. Are there not twelve hours in the day? It didn't require an answer. Everybody knew it was true. And uh, there are twelve hours in a day. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12 and verses 38 to 40. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas, just as they were pressing him for a sign in John chapter 2. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Just like they demanded a sign of him uh, in John chapter 2, they asked him for one here to prove his authority, to validate what he was doing. Uh, but now Christ gets specific. If there are 12 hours that make up a day, then there are logically 12 hours that make up the night. 24 hours in every day. So three days and three nights would be 72 hours Christ would be in the tomb. We count our days from midnight until the following midnight. But in the Jews... Uh, life in the Jewish history, they began counting at approximately 6 p.m. sundown until the following sundown. So the evening hours came on rather quickly, followed by the daytime hours until the following sundown. In fact, this is borne out in Genesis chapter 1. You don't need to turn. But in Genesis 1 verse 5, the Bible says the evening and the morning were the first day. In Genesis 1 verse 8, the evening and the morning were the second day. In verse 13, the evening and the morning were the third day. Verse 19, the evening and the morning were the fourth day, and so on. If this is true, it means that Christ couldn't have died on Good Friday and then risen right around sunrise Sunday morning. Right. Because you can't squeeze 72 hours into that day and a half time frame. Question comes up, well, couldn't Christ have been in the grave part of Friday, all of Saturday, and then a, a little part of Sunday morning to sort of satisfy the three-day uh, requirement? And the answer has to be, if you do that, you are violating the plain sense of the language on your Bible, the, the words of Jesus himself. Jesus is the one who said he would be in the tomb three days, and three nights. He said, as Jonas was in the whale 
uh, the belly of the well three days and three nights. That was a, a sign of Christ's burial. Now, I've never heard a preacher speculate, well, Jonah was only in the well part of Friday, all of Saturday, and a little bit of Sunday. Everyone accepts it as it is. They accept the story as it's written, the book of Jonah. Suppose you bought tickets to go on a, one of these weekend cruise lines or cruises. You're going to leave the port of L.A. or Long Beach, and uh, you know, you're going down to Ensenada for just a quick trip and back three days and three nights. So you go, you get on the ship Friday afternoon. And before you even wake up, you're back in the port at Long Beach uh, and being expected to disembark. You know, there's the captain thanking everybody for sailing Princess Cruise Line or whatever the company is. You go back to your travel agent and say, listen, we paid for three days and three nights. But the guy said to you, well, now technically you were on the boat Friday, part of Friday, all of Saturday, and then part of Sunday. So technically three days are involved. You wouldn't accept an explanation like that. <clears throat> you'd want some of your money back. Or you'd sue. You know, you're on people's court the next week suing. <laughs> but, and yet people will accept that rationale, they'll accept that explanation for Christ's uh, crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. They wouldn't accept it uh, in any other uh, part of life, but they, for some reason, do there. In order for Christ to be buried 72 hours, you have to push the crucifixion back to the Wednesday mm -hmm. of that week. Mm -hmm. Good Wednesday. Go to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. And I'm trying to give you these scriptures in what I think is maybe the most logical progression so that you write this down, keep this page in your Bible, and you can look at it in the future. You might have a chance to run through these scriptures to some other person who's willing to listen and say, listen, don't you think we should prove everything by the Bible? If you find some Christian who at least assents to that, Say, well, let me show you a few verses and see what you think of it. And you run through this sequence. John 19, verses 30 and 31. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not be uh, remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, parentheses, for that Sabbath day was an high day besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. A rid, uh, the body of an executed man was not to remain hanging out or out on a tree or uh, out exposed to the elements. It was to be taken care of and buried right away. And you need to turn, but Deuteronomy 21 Deuteronomy 21 and verses 22 and 23. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, the body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged on is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So it was a uh, it was a defilement to the land to have something like that decaying and exposed to the elements left out. So after someone was executed for their crime, that body was to be uh, disposed of, buried uh, rather quickly. Um, since John 19.31 says the next day was a Sabbath day, doesn't that prove that the crucifixion must have been on Friday? The answer is, verse 31 says, For that Sabbath day was an high day. It wasn't like the weekly Sabbath. There was something special about it. Go back, if you will, to the book of Leviticus, chapter 23. Levit Leviticus 23 and verses 5 through 
8. Actually, let's start at verse 4. Leviticus 23, beginning at verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. Verse 5. In the fourteenth day of the first month, at even, or evening, is the Lord's Passover. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. In the first day, that's the first of those seven, ye shall have an holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. That's a Sabbath. Verse 8, But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seventh day is an holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. Originally, the Passover was a one-day occurrence, a one-day event, followed immediately by seven days in which the Jews were expected to eat only unleavened bread for a week. But those uh, one plus seven have been combined together, and now they call it the eight days of Passover. But originally, it was not so. It was one day of the Passover observance, followed immediately by seven days of unleavened bread, or the feast of unleavened bread. And the first of those seven days, the 15th of the month, was to be a Sabbath day, a day of no work. Likewise, the 21st of the month, the end of that seven days, was also another Sabbath day. So those, those days were special. Uh, this is the Sabbath mentioned as the high day. The 15th of that uh, month was the high day mentioned there in John 19.31. It only came once a year. So between the Wednesday crucifixion and the resurrection, there were actually two Sabbath days that came up during those during that period. We'll get to that in a minute. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, Acts, well, let's see. John chapter 20. John chapter 20. I don't want to dwell on each one because I gave you several scriptures. We'll go to each one. I don't want to spend too much time, however. John 20. Notice here, verse 1. The first day of the week, this will be the, the next week following the death of Christ. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early. Notice, when it was yet dark under the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. The sun had not come up, yet she discovered the tomb already empty. So the sunrise, S-U-N-R-I-S-E, slash sunrise, S-O-N, that all these churches are going to be promoting next week, goes out the window real quickly with a little scripture. Sunrise, my foot. <laughs> And I cleaned that one up for you, didn't I? <laughs> Go to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Luke 23. And... Verses 44 to 46. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. This would have been the sixth hour of the Jewish daytime, or twelve noon. And the ninth hour would have been 3 p.m. On our, on our reckoning. So the sixth to the ninth hour of the Jewish day, it was dark for three hours. And on that ninth hour, about three in the afternoon, approximately, Christ died. If Christ died at 3 p.m., three in the afternoon, there were only about three hours to get him off of the cross, to wrap his body, wrap his body get it into the tomb, and to seal that tomb and be back in their own homes 
before sundown. Because come sundown, that high day, that 15th day of the month, was about to get started. And that was a Sabbath. And you weren't to be doing any labor on the Sabbath day. So if Christ was laid into the tomb just before sundown on that Wednesday, and I'm using our day, the names of our days for easy uh, understanding, if he was laid in the tomb just before sundown on that Wednesday, 72 hours later would take you to sundown uh, Saturday night or Saturday afternoon, right? So sometime after 6 p.m. or sundown on, on Saturday, Christ was free to come out of the tomb. So from 6 p.m. to whenever Mary Magdalene came near sunrise the next morning, Christ came out of that tomb. The Bible doesn't say exactly when. It doesn't say he rose on the first day of the week at sunrise, but they discovered the empty tomb at that time. Now, since the day started at sundown before that, it would have been technically the first day of the next week when Christ did rise. But my point is, uh, the Bible doesn't say he rose on the first day. He un undoubtedly did. But the Bible says they discovered the tomb empty on the first day. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly what time of the night Christ rose, came out of that tomb, but after 72 hours had been completed by 6 p.m. Friday, or, or rather Saturday afternoon, he was free to come out of the tomb after that. That's why when they got there early and it was still dark, they found the stone rolled away and the tomb uh, was already empty. Now, let me move on. We have to believe in a good Wednesday crucifixion, not in a good Friday crucifixion. And the sunrise slash sunrise um, is just a strange association that really isn't borne out in the scriptures. And that sort of uh, analogy doesn't have any real scripture behind it. And uh, next week, people are going to be going out to baseball stadiums or to church services at 5, 6, 7 in the morning. And there used to be sunrise. You'd go out to one of these sunrise services when the sun rose about 5, 45, 6 in the morning. Now, these churches are pushing their sunrise service later to 8, 9 in the morning, calling it the sunrise. That's because they're too lazy to roll out of bed to do it the old-fashioned way. I mean, if you're going to do it, do it. But don't just say you're doing it and just call it something else. But uh, you, I'm not, it's amazing. People are lazy. They're lazy about studying the Scripture. They're lazy about doing what they say they're doing. Now, we have some uh, a number of English words that have been derived from this whole idea. Go uh, see. Um... Now, before we get to that, go, if you will, to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Acts chapter 12. And here Herod has arrested Peter. Acts 12, verse 4. And when he had apprehended him, Peter... He put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. All the new versions of the Bible say that's a mistranslation. It shouldn't be Easter, it should be Passover. Intending <coughs> after Passover to deal with Simon Peter. But the context uh, is completely ignored. Look, start back at verse 1. Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Parentheses, then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, 
intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. He wasn't waiting for Passover. Passover had just taken place a few days before. Yeah. Just a few days before, now they're in the midst of that seven days of unleavened bread, which followed the Passover. So, unless you're suggesting that Herod was going to wait another full year till the next Passover rolled around, but the text doesn't suggest that. These events were happening rather quickly. He was waiting a space for some holiday to come and go, and then he'd deal with that. Easter was a Roman uh, pagan holiday, had nothing to do with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a number of interesting words in the English language that have, that have their uh, source in the same root. There is this one here, mm -hmm. Isis. Not the Muslim terrorist group, but this was the Egyptian goddess of fertility. And she is often depicted with uh, uh, horns, a uh, cow's horns on her, on her head, with a round sun disk in between the horns in the artwork. This is another... Uh, variation of that name, also in Egypt, Ishtar. Mm -hmm. Ishtar. Some of you have probably heard of that. Here's another one. Ashtaroth. Mm -hmm. Ashtaroth. This is a variation of the same goddess. This one was first mentioned in Judges 2, verse 13 in your Bible. Here's another variation of that spelling, although this particular word is not in the Bible. Astarte. See the, the vowel and the, and the S consonant and a T, very common in almost all these names. Here's another. Astral. Astral. Having to do with stars and the study of uh, heavenly bodies and planets. <laughs> Along those same lines is this form of the word, astro. Astro. It concerns stars and planets. And of course, the natural word extracted from that is astronaut. Like not, nautical, someone who sails the seas, in this case, he's sailing through space. So an astronaut sails through space, using the same imagery of a sailor in a ship. Astronomy is the counting and the organizing of the stars and the heavenly objects that you see in the night sky, astronomy. And we have this great one here, astrology, the study of the stars, as if to think that they have some influence over your life and your good fortune or bad fortune. And you might not have thought so, but the country of Austria is also derived from that same root. Astro, astral. And moving on. Land down under. Australia is also derived from that root. Isis, Ishtar, Ashtoreth. And even the directional word east comes from that same root. East. And so by derivation we have Easter. Acts chapter 12, verse 4, said Herod was going to keep Peter, intending after Easter to bring him unto the people. Uh, it was a Roman pagan holiday. And Easter doesn't follow the Passover, but it's the first Sunday following the first full moon of springtime. Had nothing to do with the Passover and the resurrection of Christ. It's... it's um, set based upon the movement of the planets. It has nothing to do with the resurrection of Christ at all. In 1 Kings chapter 18, when Elijah is having his contest with the 400 prophets of Baal, and they make their respective altars, and he calls to the Lord God, and they're calling to Baal, it says they called on Baal from morning until noon. Well, those would be the sunrise hours, the morning hours. And Ezekiel 8, verse 16, states the Israelites in idolatry had their backs to the temple and their faces toward the east, and they worshiped the sun toward the east. 
There's your Easter sunrise service in the Bible. It has nothing to do with the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's set this down. A couple of other things I might call to your attention. That is uh, the subject of uh, two Sabbaths during that week. Go, if you will, first of all, to Luke chapter 23. Luke 23. Verses 55 and 56. Luke 23, verses 55 and 56. And the women also, which this is after the death of Christ, and they're putting him in the tomb, and the women also, which came with him from Galilee, followed after, and beheld the sepulchre, and how his body was laid. And they returned, and prepared spices and ointments, and rested the Sabbath day, according to the commandment. That commandment can be found back in uh, Exodus chapter 20, about the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Go... Uh, back to Mark chapter 16. I'm not licking my fingers to turn pages, but my skin is dry. I get no moisture in my fingers, so i got to help it along. Actually, I just like the taste of my fingers. You know. I had some candy earlier. Mark 16 and verse 1. And when the Sabbath day was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salmoni, Salome, excuse me, Salome, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Now, how is it that the women bought and prepared spices before the Sabbath day and also after the Sabbath day? Unless you had two Sabbath days and one day in between which allowed them to buy and prepare those things they wanted to use to anoint the body of Jesus, the first chance they got. So Wednesday, Christ died. Thursday, and I'm using, like I say, I'm using the names of our, or rather our days of the week for easy uh, understanding. So Christ died on Wednesday. Um, Thursday, would have been the high day John 19.31 spoke of. Thursday was the day they were free to go and buy those things and prepare those ointments to come and put on the body of Jesus. Friday, or coming, coming up Friday to Saturday with the next Sabbath day, and then Sunday, the first day of the next week, was the only day in which they, the first day they had actual liberty and time and the freedom to come and seek to anoint the body of Jesus with these preservatives. But by the time they came, he was already out of the tomb. And he didn't rise at sunrise Easter Sunday morning. All of this Ash Wednesday Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, all of those, all that jargon, all those names are simply invented names taught to people to make them think something mystical is happening, but I'm not smart enough to understand it. I just have to trust the priest to tell me what it means. See, when you, you convince people that there's a certain secret knowledge that only a select few have access to, mm -hmm then they're beholden to you. They have to come to you to get that knowledge, to have that meted out to them little by little, piecemeal. And that's what cults want. That's what the Catholic Church wants. That's what every cult wants, to have control over the minds of people, over the thoughts of people, over the conscience of people. So they can't read the Bible on their own. They can't let the Holy Spirit teach it to them by his own grace and his uh, ability and his power to teach it. Uh, that they're not smart enough to discern the Bible on their own. They have to have someone who's would have access to special knowledge. And if that guy uh, really plays it a big, then he puts on a special costume and a special robe, special vestments to 
convey the idea that he's more holy, he's more spiritual, he's closer to God than the rest of you, and you have to become his, essentially his servants to learn what God wants you to know. Every cult operates that way in some degree or another. But uh, it's amazing how you can clear up a lot of mythology by simply comparing Scripture with Scripture, which we've just done. And let's see, I think there's one more thing I wanted to... Yeah, one more detail that I don't want to leave out. That is, go, if you will, back to Exodus chapter 12. Turn your Bible to Exodus 12. Exodus 12, and here the night of the Passover, while the Jews were still in Egypt, verse 3, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. They were to separate a lamb out on the tenth day of the first month, make sure that it had no spots or blemishes in it, that it was clean and suitable to be offered as a sacrifice. Then jump down to verse 6. And ye shall keep it, the lamb, up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. That was the night of the Passover. That was the night Christ gathered with his disciples. After sundown, they gathered, and he, he observed the Lord's, what we call the Lord's Supper now. They ate the Passover meal. And that 14th day continued until sundown after Christ's death on the cross. When they took him down, were putting him in the tomb. All of that took place on the 14th of the month. But the 10th day of the month, four days before, is when the world says Christ entered into Jerusalem, present himself as a spotless lamb, the savior of the world, and they'll tie all of this in to the Lord Jesus Christ. They associate Christ's triumphal entry on quote-unquote Palm Sunday with the 10th day of the month. And the Catholic Church never has been very good at studying the Bible and chronology. So they'll say so-called Monday Thursday going into Friday, that was the 14th day of the month. Uh, so the 10th day must have been on the Sunday before that. Christ entered into Jerusalem and they hailed him King of the Jews, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, so forth. John MacArthur, Old John MacArthur. He got a lot of publicity recently for witnessing the Ben Shapiro. And I suppose he did a pretty fair job. And uh, that video sort of went <clears throat> viral. And uh, He's not an idiot, but he's not a Bible believer either. He did, a great, he did some great work debunking the charismatics and teaching against some of their fraudulent claims back in the 70s and 80s. But John MacArthur's commentary, and I know because I read it, I even took pictures of the pages with my cell phone. He says that uh, Christ came into Jerusalem on the Monday of that week. That was the 10th day. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Friday was the 14th of that month. So he has to accept the Friday crucifixion in order to say that Christ came in on Monday and then was crucified on Friday the 14th. How could someone who's got a lot of insight, has studied the Bible a lot, and ought to know better, accept the Friday crucifixion? You can't get three days and three nights from Friday to Sunday morning. And yet that's what he writes in his commentary, that Christ entered on Monday rather than Sunday. But if Christ was crucified on the Wednesday, as we suppose, well, let's just be accurate, Tuesday sundown to Wednesday sundown, but Wednesday for our purposes, and that was the 14th of the month. That means if he, he rode into Jerusalem four days before on the 10th of the month, that would have been Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. But wait a minute, that's a Sabbath day. How could he have done that? Go, if you will, to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12.
Didn't the Lord Jesus heal on the Sabbath day? They wanted to stone him or say he's blaspheming for healing somebody on the Sabbath day. Of course, they couldn't heal anybody, but they still want to nitpick at the Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. Healing on the Sabbath day. Matthew chapter 12. And verse 11. Look what the Lord Jesus asked. And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? There's always an exception to the rule. And uh, the greater good would be to lift the, the sheep out of the pit rather than leave it there until the following day. So the greater good overrides the, the, the rule of the Sabbath day. And uh, healing on the Sabbath day would override the requirement to rest on the Sabbath day. Uh, Go, if you will, to John chapter 7. John 7, and I believe it's... Verses 21 and 22. That's lovely music, whoever's cell phone is going off. Uh, John 7, verses 21 and 22. Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers, and ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? God commanded the Jews to rest on the Sabbath day. But he also commanded them to circumcise a male on the eighth day following birth. Now, if the eighth day happened to fall on a Sabbath day, what do they do? Mm -hmm. Do they keep the Sabbath and not circumcise the boy? Or do they circumcise the boy and ignore the Sabbath? See, <laughs> God set it up in just such a way that they couldn't fulfill both. They had to choose. And those things that pertain to the welfare of a baby, uh, or to the spiritual status of a baby, to be circumcised on the eighth day, overrode the requirement to rest on the Sabbath day. And to heal somebody overrode the requirement to rest on the Sabbath day. And Christ coming into Jerusalem overrode the request not to use any beast of burden or do any labor on the Sabbath day. So that's how you get around that. That's not a problem for God. God. God who makes the rules can certainly supply an exception to the rule as it suits him. So we don't need to worry about whether Christ rode in on the Sabbath day. Uh, he undoubtedly did. But that's deeper than most Christians want to go with the Bible. All right, we're going to stop right there. And uh, we've hunted and we found a few Easter eggs that give us the details of the bigger story. Christ didn't ride into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He wasn't crucified on Good Friday. They didn't, he didn't rise from the dead at sunrise Sunday morning. All of that's just a lot of mythology and legend and fairy tales for people who don't want to read the Bible. They don't want to study the Bible. They don't want to consider the Bible. They want to ignore the Bible and do what they prefer to do and hope God will bless it anyway. Lots of luck with that.